just because we are short of time, I just want to let's move to the last talk. Um, so the last talk is um, presented by Sophia Fantugo. I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing your <laughs> last name. No uh, uncovering bias in personal informatics. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for sticking with us till the end. I am Sophia Fadidou, a final, PhD final year PhD student at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. And in the next eight minutes, I will give you a preview of how you can integrate machine learning fairness notions into your personal informatics and by extent, you become work. First time I pitched this idea to my fairness collaborator, let's say, the response was, it's just steps, isn't it? Well, I believe that we are all aware here that personal informatics systems can no are nowadays capable of way more things, from fault detection to fertility prediction and AFib assessments, a wealth of sensitive and high stakes health consum consumer health applications. The truth is that the field of machine learning fairness has been studied quite widely in the recent years. For example, in the natural language processing community, but as well as in the computer vision com community. You might have even watched the Netflix documentary, Coded Bias. But what about the Ubicom community? Well, fairness in the Ubicom community and by extent personal informatics has not received any significant attention to the day. But my, pair, my, but my paper is called Uncovering Bias in Personal Informatics, not Fairness. So why I'm here talking to you about fairness? Confusing, right? So let's put our definition straight. So bias is a systematic error that favors one outcome or one group over another, and it is fully quantifiable. Fairness, on the other hand, is subjective and contextual, and it is judged against a set of legal or ethical principles which are relevant in a specific time and place. That being said, bias in machine learning can be a potential source of unfairness that can lead to harmful outcomes, such as discrimination, depending on the context. But why should we care about it? Well, first and foremost, uh, ethically, to respect, promote, and preserve human rights and do no harm. At the same time, more and more companies are realizing the rise of the responsible AI AKA RAI movement, and step up to the challenge by publishing their own RAI principles. If they don't and something goes wrong, let's say, they are in danger of significant reputational risks as well as legal implications given the current as well as upcoming regulatory actions such as the EU AI Act. So cool, how can we uncover biases now? It's slightly more complicated than that. To provide an answer to this question, we followed the seven-stage framework proposed by Suarez and Gutag, discussing sources of harm in the machine learning life cycle. Based on this framework, we assessed the biases included both in personal informatics data and models, with the goals of one, raising awareness within the community, and two, providing a blueprint, blueprint for future work. The framework presents seven types of biases, in two data streams, uh, in two streams, the data stream and the model stream. In the data stream, we have three types of biases, the historical representation and measurement bias. In the model implementation and building stream, we have four types of biases, the learning bias, aggregation bias, deployment and evaluation bias. Now, I don't have the time exactly to present every type of bias that we analyzed, but you can find all these details in the paper. And of course, we're gonna go through some of them in the next slide, and please find me back in the posters for more questions. To enable our analysis, we studied the largest open personal informatics data set today, the including heterogeneous mobile and wearable data collected in the wild from thousands of users, the My Heart Counts data set from Stanford University. Our task is to predict future physical activity based on past behavior formed as a binary classification task, an indicative but nevertheless useful use case in empower consumer health applications. 
At the same time, our dataset contains a variety of sensitive attributes, including demographics, clinical characteristics, and health conditions. In the data, representation biases can occur when uh, the sampling methods we use lead to underrepresenting certain population segments. First, we want to see if our dataset, for example, is representative of the real world population. So we compare the dataset demographics, which you can see here in green, with the real world statistics about the population in the US uh, at the time of the data collection in pink. I just want to highlight as an, as an example that while you would expect to have one woman per every man in the data set, uh, because we are approximately 50-50 in the real world, in the My Heart Counts data set you only have 0.2 women per every man in the data set, meaning that you have five times fewer women within the data. But let's say even if you sampled perfectly and you managed to include one woman uh, for every man in the data set, you could still have data that suffer from representation bias. How? Well, because representation bias can hide in the target variable as well. In the My Heart Counts data, for example, where we use physical activity as a target variable, we notice that women, non-white people, and patients with diabetes and joint issues tend to perform less physical activity in the data compared to their counterparts. Now, is this realistic? Maybe yes, due to historical biases as well as other differences, but the question is how can we take these differences into consideration so that we avoid uh, representation biases propagating into the remaining pipeline. When it comes to model building, aggregation biases can occur when we use one-size-fits-all models, when in reality our data have underlying user groups that require separate attention. To test for biases in our use case, we initially compared two models, um, two LSTM models. One aware model, which takes sensitive attributes such as gender into account in their feature set, and one unaware model, which does not consider such, fe such features. And in principle, it shouldn't be biased against, against any group. In the, in the diagram, you can see the sensitive attributes on the x-axis, and you can see the disparate impact ratio, which is a fairness metric, on the y-axis. I have to note here that the disparate impact ratio of one is optimal, while anything outside of the pink range you see, whether it is above or below, is considered unfair. The data biases are given in the green bar for reference, and what I want to say is that uh, we can see that the aware models, which are in pink, propagate or even amplify biases across many data attributes. Here I highlight hypertension as an indicative example. Similarly, unaware models, so models that do not use uh, sensitive attributes as features, are also not foolproof against data biases due to the existence of proxy features. Proxy features are features that are correlated with sensitive attributes. Bottom line, ignoring data biases or taking out protected attributes from your feature set does not really solve the problem. Uh, one final slide. In the model evaluation phase, uh, evaluation biases can occur when the benchmark data set that you use is not representative of the real world population. To test for evaluation biases in our use case, we compared a perfect synthetic data set that we created in solid lines with the original random test set that we benchmarked in the beginning in dust lines. What we noticed is that the perfect synthetic data set bench a benchmark data set can hide imperfections in the trained models that were otherwise visible with a random test set. In simpler words, it's not very difficult to hide the truth of unfairness if you choose your benchmark wrongfully, unintentionally, or with deceitfulness. And I believe that's dangerous. Finally, wrapping up disclaimer, this paper is not a critique on the My Heart Counts data set. It's a huge help to the research community. At the, same t at the same time, it's not a comprehensive list of all biases that can emerge in the personal, uh, personal informatics life cycles. But it is a methodological approach of how you can uncover biases in your own personal informatics projects, as well as a warning towards the community that we should be more aware when building such systems. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope I persuaded you to perform more fairness assessments in the future when you build and test models. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting. So I invite all authors to, to join the stage. Um, very quick question about the last paper before we start the discussion. <laughs> 